Good, and thank you for joining us for our National Disability Institute's Financial Wellness Webinar Series, sponsored by Accorda Therapeutics. My name is Elizabeth Jennings. I'm the Director for Training and Technical Assistance at National Disability Institute, and I'll be one of your speakers today. Our webinar today is Saving and Investing for Workers and for Individuals on Public Benefits. We have um, a guest speaker with us, Marlene Ware from Warrior Support Services, a division of the National Foundation for Debt Management. We're very appreciative to Marlene for being on the line with us today. I'll say you're going to be hearing from a colleague at National Disability Institute, Ms. Nakia Matthews. Today we're going to give you some housekeeping tips. We're going to provide an overview of the financial wellness survey results. Uh, this is a survey that we provided to the MS community to frame the webinars that we provide. We're also give, going to give an overview of the importance of economic empowerment. We'll hear from Marlene on investing when there is no money to invest. We're going to talk about savings and public benefits so that if any of you on the line have concerns about that, you can have some of your questions addressed. And I'm going to give you a few next steps to help you apply what you learned today to your own life. over to Nakia for some housekeeping tips. Good everyone. The for today's webinar is being broadcast through your computer. Make sure that your speakers are turned on and up so that you can hear or that you plug in your headphones. You can pull the audio via the audio broadcast panel, which you see there. If you accidentally close the panel or if the sound stops or becomes a little jumbled, you can reopen the panel from the top menu by going to Communicate and Join Audio Broadcast. If you have sound capabilities on your computer or you prefer to listen by phone, you can go into the number you see here and enter the meeting code. You do not need to enter an attendee ID. Please, in the lower right-hand side of your screen, we have closed captioning available for participants who are deaf, hard of hearing, or where English is a second language. You can down this window if you don't want to see it, minimizing the media viewer, or if you'd like it to be bigger, you can mess some of the other panels like chat or Q&A. If you experience any technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the chat box to send a message to me, Nakia Matthews, or you may email Elizabeth Jennings at ejennings.com at ndi-inc.org. At the webinar, we're going to have a Q&A session. Please use the chat or Q&A box to send any questions that you have during the webinar to Beth or me, Nakia Matthews, and we will field them and answer them at the end of the webinar. If you're by phone and not logged into the webinar, you may ask questions by emailing them directly to Elizabeth Jennings at ejennings, ndi inc Org. Please note this webinar is being recorded and the material will be placed on the AI website at www.realeconomicimpact.org. To get started, I'd like to spend a, extend a special thank you to our sponsor, Accorda Therapeutics. It is through the financial support of Accorda Therapeutics that these webinars are made possible. So, we'll by talking about what is financial wellness. We find financial wellness as the state of a person's finances with intent of working towards financial behaviors that limit stress and the impact of stress on one's daily life. Financial is impacting several parts of a person's life, and therefore um, you can think about it in se as several different components. Be financially literate, saying affordable financial services, utilizing favorable tax provisions, budgeting, understanding public benefit rules, and maintaining assets, accessing available health care subsidies, and owning the impact of work on long-term disability. As many of you on the line may know, today's webinar is the last in our series for 2012, and we discussed all of the things that you see on this slide. So if you haven't had a chance to learn about each of these different aspects of financial wellness, I encourage you to go to our website, 
www.realeconomicimpact.org and watch any or all of the webinar archives um, to increase your knowledge. So if you're wondering why we talk about um, poverty and in relation to the disability community. And in part, it's for this reason. Uh, the 2010 U.S. Census Bureau statistics noted that for individuals age 18 to 64, individuals without disabilities lived below the poverty level at a rate of 12.8%. For individuals with disabilities, that rate was more than two times the other, or 27.3%. So um, almost a third of individuals with disabilities were living with income below the poverty level. A huge number of individuals and um, something that we should be thoughtful of and want to address. With the economic recovery that's taken place throughout the country, we feel that no group in America is more in need or more deserving, but it's ultimately been overlooked. For millions of working age adults with disabilities, a dependence on public benefits for income, health care, food, and housing often becomes a trap that requires limiting income to remain eligible. And some of you on the line who you yourself receive a public benefit or you know or support someone who receives a public benefit that has income or, a or asset limits, you know that this can be incredibly uh, frustrating and challenging to the individual because the public benefit rules uh, tell them you're not to earn money, you're not allowed to save money, you're not allowed to build assets. And what we hope people will learn from this webinar series and from sending additional questions and requests to National Disability Institute is that while many of the public regulations look and present as though individuals cannot earn, cannot save, and cannot build assets, um, once you start to understand the rules within those programs, you find that there are opportunities to earn, to save, and to build. So financial wellness is important. Well, for many of these reasons, it impacts a person's mental and physical health. It can positively or negatively impact their self-concept, depending on which way their finances are going. It changes a person's status with other community stakeholders and directly impacts a person's quality of life. As individuals incur more disabilities and more disability-related costs, they can find that their opportunities to participate in community life often come with a price, um, a price for um, accessible transportation, a price for the different medications that may be needed to be fully active. And so understanding an individual's um, finances can be very important. It can be that gain. Uh, that will either open or close their opportunity to fully participate in community life. Before we started this webinar series in 2011, um, we, along with our partners at MSAA, did a survey so that we could understand the state of um, individual finances amongst individuals with MS all across the country. Um, more than 2,000 individuals responded to the survey. And here is uh, some snapshot of what we learned. We learned that more than 55% of households uh, that responded earn less than $35,000 annually. And their 16.5% earn less than $50,000, but more than $35,000. We asked about the ability to pay all of the purse bills in the typical month. 32% of the people who responded said they have a very difficult time paying their bills, and almost half reported a somewhat difficult time. All 43% reported that their financial status has affected their ability to access medical care at some point. We learned that almost two-thirds, or 71.7% of people, know that they do not have enough savings to cover three months expenses. Uh, at, over the past couple of years, um, people have encouraged Americans not only to have three months expenses in the bank, but to strive to have six months expenses in the bank. And as you can see from the response from folks with MS, that would be a pretty big leap. We found that 
67% reported that their finances were worse since their MS diagnosis, and then almost two-thirds, or 73.7% of people, noted that they were not aware of or have not used different financial stability programs, including EITC, which is the Earned Income Tax Credit, IDA, which is Individual Development Account, and you'll be learning about that today, FSS, Family Self-Sufficiency Programs, and PASS, Plan for Achieving Self-Support. Each of these are opportunities that are um, provided and supported by through uh, federal funding. And, um, we talked about these on our webinars. So again, if you haven't had a chance to learn about any of these opportunities, I encourage you to reach out to me after the webinar or to view our archives. There are a lot of financial wellness strategies that exist in the community, and many of them were set up not necessarily for individuals with disabilities, but for any community member who needed some support on their finances. The strategies include financial literacy, budgeting, credit repair, and getting banked. Really, by getting banked, I mean finding affordable financial services. All strategies include the use of work incentives, which is part of the Social Security uh, public benefit rules, the use of tax incentives, volunteer income tax assistance, and the earned income tax credit. Medicaid buy-in programs, which can be very helpful if any of you online have a disability, are working, and are in need of Medicaid. Self-sufficiency programs, individual development accounts, assistive technology loan funds, student loans, and retirement accounts, which are ways that you, you can help to um, save and build assets. Any of these don't count against public benefit programs. I should say public benefit program eligibility. Post education, employment, self employment, micro enterprise, and home ownership, which could all be strategies that one is working towards. And the bottom box provides you with some information on people that can help as individuals are striving to build their financial wellness. It's protection and advocacy, taxpayer advocates, counseling, voluntary income tax assistance, and benefits planning. I want to note that um, with the exception of the strategies that are specific to Social Security, which would be work incentives, um, these different strategies were really designed to assist anybody who was seeking to improve their finances. And then many of them have um, additional opportunities um, for individuals with MS or individuals with other disabilities. I want to take the opportunity to um, introduce Marlene Ware. She's the Director of Financial Stability for Warrior Support Services, which is a division of National Foundation for Debt Management. Marlene had the opportunity to speak on our webinar last year, and she did an excellent job. I learned a lot, and we got great feedback. So we brought her back again this year, and we're very, very grateful to have her on the line. And um, can I, I'm very excited to, to listen to Marlene and to learn more again this year. So thank you, Marlene, and welcome. Thank good grief, that makes me nervous. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I do love to talk, though, so this is going to work out just fine. Um, Warrior Support Services is probably what I work at maybe about 60% of the time. I go out and uh, speak to deploy military uh, or deploying military or military men and women who are returning from a deployment. And oftentimes um, they have low income, they have lost their jobs, um, finances haven't gone into rack and ruin during their deployment, and uh, I, I try to help them pull it together. I also work with the civilian population. Um, a good part of my time is spent with Habitat for Humanity, helping folks that are low income, um, up the credit enough, and save enough money so that they can purchase and build a Habitat for Humanity home. That's near and dear to my heart. Um, but all of this is near and dear to my heart. Um, financiability has really opened my eyes. Although I teach kids since I'm in the, the final quarter here and I don't have time to make a big difference financially in my own life, I have time enough to help other people make a difference in their life. Um, so even though we may not be making 
collecting $30,000 or $40,000 a year was optimized uh, because of our income level because there are things that we can do. Slide that I'm going to click to, it works. I hope it does. I just used this last weekend with the Air Force uh, Reserve, and it, it's very neat, and yet it's kind of poignant. So let's cross our fingers and see if I click through if it's going to work for us. Ooh, it might. It's not going to. A word for it. This is a really funny clip about not spending money. Um, Saturday Night Live skit. Um, laughing about um, buying stuff with money that you have not saved yet. And that is absolutely the first rule of investing. If spending money that you haven't even earned yet, then there won't be any money left over to try to invest. And by invest, I don't mean um, uh, in the stock market and you know uh, turn into Warren Buffett over the next three years. Um, investing can be as simple as just saving money. So let's say, just say for instance, you've been spending money that you didn't need to spend. Let's just say, for instance, you go to Starbucks three times a week. And you guys have all heard this. So you go to Starbucks three times a week, maybe seven hundred and fifty a week, about 30 a month, maybe $360 a year. If you do without Starbucks coffee three times a week, you could have $360 a year that you could do something else with, say, it. If it was in an account that wasn't earning out of interest, it would still be $360. And, and all of that has everything to do with opportunity cost. And I know you've all heard of opportunity cost, and it's what you could have done if you make the choice that you did. It's not just money, other things. For me, it would be like a bag of potato chips, so I gained the four pounds. And, you know, I could have worn that cute outfit if I hadn't eaten the bag of chips. Same thing with money. If you send it, Starbucks coffee, what could you have done with that money that you spent on Starbucks? Opportunity cost. That was a good clip. Wish you could have seen it. So, rule of investing. You've seen this before, too. It, you can't find money to invest if spending leaks. Or if you don't have a debt reduction plan, if you have a little bit of debt out there, you haven't taken care of it, um, even if it's gone to collections, even if it's in judgment, even if things are really bad, it, it can all still be fixed. And this I know because this is what I do every day of my life. Um, so if you're going to, if you've got debt, so write, down, write what your debts are. Not I owe on a car payment, but how much do you owe on the car? What are interest rate? What a monthly payment? What's the big picture on that? After writing all that down, in case you can't remember everything, pull your credit reports from annualcreditreport.com. Who you are, no matter where you live, no matter what your income, no matter what, you should be pulling your credit reports every single year, all three of them, Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion. And through freecreditreport.com, because you know that's not really free, the only place is annualcreditreport.com. Pull that credit report, and, and I'll tell you something that I've learned about annual credit report credit reports. You will get more information than you can ever imagine when you pull that credit report. If you get from your from your bank, uh, or if you have one of those services that you play so that pay so that they monitor your credit, They'll give you credit reports, but it's a very condensed credit report. Sometimes it, it could even be a tri-merge, which makes it even more condensed. Annualcreditreport.com will tell you when you got the debt, when it's going to be paid off. Um, if it's in collections, it will tell you how long until it airs and comes out of collections and off of your credit report, seven years. Um, that's all information that you want to have. If, if you're going to get the big picture of where you are so you can get so organized that you can find money to save, 
you do it. You've, you've got to make this a little bit of a job to put everything, look at everything, see where you are, make spreadsheets. It, it actually is kind of fun in a in a weird kind of way. So get all your debt written down, get your credit reports, and then start to track your expenses. Your expenses are one thing. They can't change. Um, if you have a car payment, you have a car payment. That's it. it it's 300 it's 300 um, If you have a, a rent payment and 900 it's 900 That's it. Those are fixed. You can't change those. You have to work around those. But I love flexible expenses because if we want to try to find any spare cash, any place in your budget, it's going to be with your flexible expenses, like your gas consumption, like your electric, like your groceries, like your Starbucks. Those are all flexible. Now, let me, because I talk about this all the time, I have to try things. So I, I tell my low-income folks all the time, come on, you can cut back on your electric. I know you can. So I'm going to try because I'm telling them that they can. First of all, I had the energy auditor come and and tell me where all my leaks were in my, my electricity usage. And then because I'm gone a lot, or even if I'm just gone to work, I will hit the breakers on things that I don't need on the house, like breakers to my TVs and the breakers to the lights in the bathroom. I don't ever shut the breaker for the refrigerator. I do shut the breaker for the hot water tank because I'm using it during the day. And uh, believe it or not, the lowest I have gotten my electric bill so far was $39. If I don't watch it, if I just my phone's plugged in, leave my computer on, uh, the TV's you know plugging all the time. My electric bill average probably sixty five or seventy. So if you're looking for ways to to carve out a little bit of money from this this budget or this this plan that you're putting, your flexible expenses may be the place. Um, debit cards. If any of you are using debit cards and you're probably not writing down your um, in your register, you're not writing them down. If you're like my my own daughters, who nobody always say it's in their head, they've got it covered. You want to think about saving receipts, and then if you're going to save the receipts, you might want to take a look at them every once in a while to see where your money is going. Um, when you buy something, now they they ask you, do you want your receipt? Which I think is a little bizarre because of course you want your receipt. Save your receipts. Between the the fixed, the flexible, and the debit cards, tighten everything up. So so their budget, all that, it doesn't have to be on a grid. It doesn't have to be in QuickBooks. It can be on a piece of paper. Um, so now now that you've got, you, you know what your is, you've looked at your credit reports, you've got kind of a, a budget, a workable budget, start to pay down the existing debt. I personally prefer to pay down the smallest debt first. And why? Because I need uh, I need to accomplish something. I need to make it happen. So if I have a small debt that I could pay down in two months, then I'm the winner. I pay it down in two months, and psychologically I'm all that and a box of nuts because I paid down a debt. If you choose my largest debt to pay down and I work at it and work at it and work at it and just not seeing any impact, I may not have the attention span and stick with it long enough to make it happen. And I always go back food with me. I, I go back to when I want to lose weight. If, if I go on a diet and I try to lose weight and I go for a whole week, just not eating anything, drinking water, eating oatmeal, doing all the right thing. Don't lose any weight. I'm telling you what, on the weekend I'm going to eat potato chips because nothing has happened. I need to see something happen, and that keeps me on track. And the same thing with debt. For me, I pick the smallest thing. You may want to pick something that has a really high interest rate on work, work, work on it first, but you know yourself. You know what works with you. Number five, there is no new debt. When you're paying down your debt, when you're working on a budget, when you're trying to find a way to come up with cash that you can invest, you don't want to make more more debt. No more new debt for the short term. Um, and then 
I, I just to everyone, and they look at me like you've lost your mind, lady. Start a savings account just for practice. If you don't have one, let's just practice dollar. Start a savings account with a dollar. Save, start a savings account with five dollars. And do it habitually, and it will become a habit. And I tell you from experience, once you get $100 in an account, you don't want to touch it because it's so awesome that you got $100 in a savings account. And 100 will be 200 and then 300 By the time it gets to $500, you, you are on a roll. Money is pretty psychological. Invest in a debt-free future. And as a general rule, whether it's a mortgage or a car loan or a student loan, uh, credit card bills or medical bills, all debt should be retired as soon as you can. Um, and the feeling of living debt-free for life is certainly worth the sacrifice required to reach that goal. And while I've got you here on this screen, student loans, student loans are the real deal. If you have any student loans that you have not been paying on because you don't have the money, something that you need to address because student loans by and large are federal loans and one way or another they'll get their money from you. So if if this is an issue, if, if student loans are an issue with you, um to me and let talk to you about the, the different options you have, but not paying a student loan probably is not your best option. Um in a minute talk about compound interest and student loans have the best compound interest against you that you ever imagine. I've I've worked with people that have maybe gone seven years without paying their student loans, and they can't even identify their student loans when they finally look at them because they've grown so big. Kind of compound interest we can only dream of. Okay, so we got it in place. Now to find money. So let's if working. This only if you have earned income. So you may not have earned income. You may be on benefits. Maybe your spouse is earning money. This is earned income tax credit. It is an absolute miracle. Most of the, the low-income people that I work with, um, because it gives them one time a year uh, a chunk of change that they can make a difference with. They put 10% in an emergency savings account, and, and right out of the gate, they've got money in an emergency savings account. They can pay down debt, and they can even take a bit and have a little fun. Um, I think the rates are the same this year as they were last year. If you have an earned income of um, 45000 singly or 50000 um, if you're filing joint and you have to file jointly, and you have uh, three or more qualifying children, your income tax credit this year would be almost $6,000, about almost $1,500. That is a lot of money. Um, and if you already are, are getting money back, this is not going to be just a credit. This is going to be uh, a money that goes into your bank account. And even if you have no, no children, only earn this year, thirteen thousand, four thousand dollars. You still would qualify for almost five hundred dollars back. Never turn yours up at five hundred dollars. Um, the one caveat to this is, um, you can any income investments of more than thirty-two hundred dollars this year. This year, um, you you're going to have it done anyway this year. Um, a Vita site, one of those free Vita sites. You can call 211. I, I think almost every community now has a, a 211. If you call 211, um, they will tell you where the free Vita site to have your taxes done is near you, and you can just call and, and set up a time. If you're not sure if you're eligible for earned income tax credit, because there are a, a few caveats to it, and like I said, SS and SSDI don't qualify. But but go to the EITC homepage, just Google EITC homepage, and you can get some more information. But but let me tell you, if you've got two kids 
and you're making $47,000 a year, you and, and your wife or your husband, um, some money back. But the lower your income, the more you're going to get back with the earned income tax credit. So, so if if you're only making 20000 and you've got three kids, you're going to get the whole the whole amount. You're going to get the 5800 back or the 5200 Income tax credit is one of the most life-changing things that comes to my low-income people that I work with every year. They look forward to it. They plan for it all along. And generally, they don't misuse it. Generally, they make it work for them. Um, an IA. This, I, I participated in an IDA program last year, and if you guys don't know what an IDA program is, this is also something that you think about. You should think about closely. Um, an individual development account, an IDA, it's a special savings account that matches the deposits of uh, low and moderate income people. For every dollar saved in an IDA, the others receive a corresponding match, uh, which serves as, as a reward and an incentive, um, and it creates that habit of saving. I just did an IDA program with the local United Way. Well, I, actually, I was involved in it for about two and a half years now. And I have had two people um, start small businesses. One woman started Rose's Rolling Kitchen. She makes um, uh, these Jamaican food in the town area in her, her rolling truck, and someone else started a moving company. I had uh, three people get into their own homes, and uh, the rest of the I think there were four others that, that decided to continue their education. IDA is only asset building. That's the only thing you can use the match savings for. The IDA program that I was working with, it was a three-to-one match. So if the, the women would save, these were only women, um, if they would save $2,000 over this two-year period, then they would get a match of $1,000. So they walked away with $8,000. That's a pretty good return on your money. Most IDA programs uh, need to be completed within two to three years. That means once you once you join the IDA program, start saving money, you two or three year window to save the two thousand. Two thousand is usually the limit. But during that two to three years you also have an opportunity or an obligation uh to work with your mentor. I'm a mentor. I'm IDA mentor. So you would work with, with your mentor to uh create a good, stable financial base in your personal life. Make uh, sure that you have a budget, make sure that you're not doing non sufficient funds. Make sure you really understand where your money is going to. It's it's required. You agree to do it, but it's a good thing. Um, then you save for those years for asset building purpose, whether it's to go back to school, start a business, uh, get training, um, house. Part of all of this is uh, IDA program. Uh, it is a TANF or an AFI, an AFI. Program. It doesn't matter if you are uh, income comes from SSI or SSDI. So IDs are federally funded. So if it's a TANF program or AFI stands for Assets for Independence. If it's either one of those programs um, that is sponsoring the IDA, you can be that's and still save money and be in the IDA program. Um, have an, as if you're earn, you are in an SSDI, any IDA program. It, it doesn't matter if it's a TANF because there are some some that are funded not through TANF or AFI. To find an IDA program, it's easy to can go and I'm going to read this to you. So I'll read it slowly to C F E D G backslash Bash A D A S Bash Directory under search. And we'll take you to the site that will list all of the IDA programs in any community that you're living in or any that are close. 
So ideograms are are fantastic, fantastic. Um, and as far as asset building, people us that, that are not making a lot of money, ownership becomes an asset, asset that's going to increase in value. Education is an asset, or job training is an asset, so that we can earn more money. Um, and starting a, a small business or a micro enterprise absolutely will, will bring more money into um, account. Do you want to save or invest? Do you want to save and invest? There's a difference. Um, investing, investing is more of a, um, you're concerned about the, the bottom line of increasing your money. It's not saving money now so you can grow it for things you want and need in the future. Um, investing can grow money even more than traditional savings offer but it's a little bit riskier. Just plain old savings is focused on the safety of the principal. That if you want to hold money, you're more concerned about holding it, not so concerned about growing it beyond what you're putting into the account. So what I know is with the higher the risk, potential earnings, so if our not reverse. It's possible that you could earn more money by investing, but the, the trick there is to balance the risk and the reward. So, so the, what do you want? What are your investing goals? Why would anybody save money or invest money if they didn't have a goal? You've got to have a goal. How much can you handle? Said, I'm in the final quarter. I can't risk any money. I've got to hang on to as much money as I can. I'm very balanced in everything that I do financially. And how liquid must your investments be? You lock your money up in an IRA or a 401k where you can't get to it until you're 59 and a half? Or do you get to be more liquid? Combination of everything. Compound interest is what makes our funds rock and grow, not necessarily in the stock market. The stock market isn't interest-based. It's, it's investment that grows, but not necessarily because of, of interest, compounding interest. Um, it, comp interest can be earned on savings accounts, uh, money market accounts, uh, some bonds you can earn compound interest on, CDs. Um, some stocks, in, in a way, if you... you Invest your dividends, but that's salts. But let's just look at this. In fact, everybody in the world that's been an economist says, I don't know what the seven wonders of the world are, but I do know the eighth is compound interest because it is incredible. Compound interest is interest upon interest. So interest is at the end of the year, you make your 5% interest, and next year on you are five percent, but it doesn't compound it. It's not the principal any interest, but earning interest. But that's how compound interest works. So let's look at this chart. Let's say you invest a hundred bucks, just hundred bucks, and you're earning compound interest of five percent. In tears, that one hundred that one time investment of a hundred dollars is now one hundred and sixty-three dollars. If fifty years. The time investment of $100 is now $1,147. But at the 13%. 11%, we used to say that the stock market generally gains at 11%, so we always throw 11% in there. So, so let's look at 11%. If you had a one-time one -time investment of $100 that was earning 11% compound interest, 50 years, that $100 would be 18000 Really, I do show this to high school kids, though, to get them in the mode where maybe they would want to save some money. It's not realistic because it, 50 is a long time to, to just let $100 set to earn 11% 11, 11 interest. Pretty unrealistic, but pound interest is what makes everything happen. You can always also do the rule of 72, which I like. If you have something that is earning 2% um, interest, 
72 divided by 2%, and that will tell you that 36 years, your money will double in 36 years, and that's on compound interest. 72 divided by the interest rate is equal to the number of years it will take you to double your money, the rule of 72. What's your reality? What what can you handle? Um, being too deep means you may not accumulate enough money for the goal you have set for yourself. Too aggressive means that you could lose some or all of your money. And, and the the knowledge is the key. What works for you. My 401k. Tell you about my 401k. Um, for many years when I was raising my children, I I, I was a school teacher. And I didn't even buy into the 403B because I didn't understand what it was and I was just trying to pay the bills. Um, for seven years, I've had a 401K. It's balanced because of my age. It's low risk. It's very safe. Um, and yet it has increased not by my deposits, not by my employer's deposits. It has increased through time because of the types of investments by $10,000 in in seven years. So I'm making well over 1500 a year just as I've got those investments. It could go away. Yes, it's it's risky. Not as risky as something like the radio stock that I bought about 10 years ago. Um, it's not well thought out. It was someone who told me they knew everything about the stock market. And they told me that this was a good technical investment. So I put my $20,000 into XM satellite stock, and it rose like crazy. And I finally believed in the stock market. And it got up to about $440, and that's when the stock market fell apart. And it went down to $360,000 down by Three hundred six thousand dollars before I pulled it out, so I I didn't lose everything because my investment was twenty thousand, but I lost so much, um, and it's because I didn't know what I was doing and I was listening to somebody else even though my heart wasn't in it. I thought that they knew more than I knew. You than you think. Um, you can tell when something is not right. Um, in a minute, I'm going to tell you, if you want to invest in stocks, I'm going to tell you how to find a, a broker that will um, information that you need and be trustworthy and honest. If you're going to save, let's talk about low-risk options. I'm a big fan now of low-risk options. You don't make a bazillion dollars, but you also don't lose your money. Um, a savings account, a bank savings account, they they are oops, low. Uh, very liquid, so if you need to have access to your money, you have this. The FDIC insured up to 250000 No one has ever lost their money in an FDIC insured bank. Uh, there's very little return on your investment, but it's safe. It is all taxable. I went to, to uh, bankrate.com. Bankrate.com, you're going to see on the bottom a lot, a lot of these screens. Bankrate.com has great information. It compares checking accounts, uh, credit cards, savings accounts, uh, money markets. It has a lot of comparison, easy to read, easy to move around in. So I found Barclays, a bank savings account, not a brick and mortar, but a, an online bank, Barclays. Their deposit, our savings account is a 1%, 0 Deposit required, and there are no fees. Ally Bank is 0.95 percent deposit and no fees. You're not going to find those kind of rates at a, at a brick and mortar bank. You're not going to find it. The online banks are absolutely safe and secure. Um, they're not convenient because you can't walk into them. But if you save money, if all you want to do is find a place to tuck it and to earn a little bit of interest, absolutely online savings accounts. Risk option number two, a money market savings account. It looks an awful lot like just a regular savings account. Um, again, are low to no risk, highly liquid, but generally uh, they give you checks, and maybe you can only write three or four checks a month. You do have to keep a certain amount in the out, or you, or, um, you get Again, it is FDIC 
insured up to 250000 generally earns a higher rate at banks than a bank savings account. It's taxable. So I found EverBank online at 0.01%. You have to have a minimum deposit of 1000 And there are fees. May, and I see these all the time because I have Sally May student loans come in my email all the time, 1.05%, no minimum deposit, and no fees. So of the two of those, definitely the Sally May money market account may be the best bet. Um, how to find these rates if you go into Wells Fargo or Bank of America or, or um, Grow Financial. Um, I, these are the rates that you're going to find if you're online. But again, go to bankrate.com and to look at what they've got on bank rate. And you can make choices from there. And you can also go to your bank. If you have a good relationship with your bank, you can just go in and, and talk to them about what can I do? You know, I found this online. Can you can you match this if you have a good relationship with your bank? Low risk option number three, and this one comes with some caveats. Um, short and long term CDs. Um, CDs are certificates of deposit. It's money that you loan to a bank so that they can use it uh, and you agree to keep it in their bank for a certain amount of time, three months, six months, five years, ten years. And while it's in their bank, you're earning interest. While it's in their bank, they are using it and are charging someone else more interest to use the money that you are earning. Um, it's low to no risk. It's liquid, but if you pull out before um, the three months, six months, five years, whatever, you're going to lose some of the interest. And I think it's generally three months of interest that you you lose if you pull it out before it's the it's maturity. It's I see insured uh, for two hundred fifty thousand and. It may earn a little bit more than a bank savings account or a money market account. So an ally bank, it's a year CD. That means you have to keep there for a year at 1.04% and a zero minimum deposit. And no city bank, a 1.3%, a $1,000 minimum deposit, no fees. Um, it's could be a good thing. The, the thing I always think about with CDs is it's going to earn interest faster than the inflation rate. So I uh, uh, Bank and Bank of America and PNC and SunTrust all had 10-year CDs with a yield of 1.75%, uh, maybe a little bit less. So they are less interest that inflation. So that may because that money is trapped and you can't get to it without a penalty, that may not be your best avenue to save money. Although it is in there where you can't get to it, so it's not going to go anywhere. It's just not going to earn as quickly as the rate of inflation. Low risk. Now the risks go up. Um, if if you're going to start in things like securities, um, stocks, mutual funds, um, even if you're going to uh, try to develop your own kind of a, a retirement account, uh, you need to t- talk to a broker. But don't just go through the yellow pages and pick a broker. Go to uh, www.saveandinvest.org. If you, when you go to that site, Right on the very margin of the page, it says find a broker. And if you have a broker in mind, if you have found a broker in the yellow pages, you can put that person's name in where it says find a broker. And they'll tell you if he all his certifications, if got any lawsuits pending. And you'll be able to make a, a little bit better educated um, voice when it comes to a broker. Don't go it alone, though. Um, I, I will tell you, my brother for years, was a, uh, a day trader, and you bet he made a bunch of money, bunch of bunch of money. Um, but that's all he did. All he did all day long was sit in front of a computer. He thought he knew everything about the stock market. But my dad said, "You're never out smart Wall Street because those are the movers and shakers. They've got the money. They're making the stock market move. One little guy 
okay, with $20,000 is not, not making a difference. Be very careful. Be very careful. This is your money, and it comes and goes so quickly. You could do long-term securities. Those are bonds. They're a loan to the, the government. They're liquid. They can lose value because they're attached to the government. Um, dividends. The way to make it work for you is to do the dividend but have it put right back in. So reinvest the dividend, and then you're going to make more money. Stocks and mutual funds, no guarantees. Um, it's risky. It's liquid. Um, mutual funds come with a lot of fees. Even stocks, if you're, you're trading online, there's going to be fees. Everything there's fee. Mutual funds have a lot of fees. Know what you're getting into before you start putting your money in it. Um, retirement accounts like IRAs and 401ks and 403bs and Roth IRAs. Um, you must have earned income. Those are all based on earned income. Um, some are tax deferred. Um, like 401ks are tax deferred. There are no guarantees. Um, they're liquid with penalties. You can't start taking your money out until you're 59 and a half. You borrow against them for certain reasons, but the money has to be paid back. Um, pay. I think the annual amount that you can put in is five thousand. Unless you're over fifty, then you can put in six thousand. Um, a four hundred one k, some fifty, you can put seventeen thousand a year in. If you're over fifty, you can put twenty two thousand in. I, I went on. Um, I use Power Wallet, um, Power dot com. It's my budgeting tool of choice, and my four hundred one k is on Power Wallet. So I looked at it today. I made $200 today in my 401k. Very surprising because it's been very slim pickings. But it was exciting to see that I had gone up. So this is a trend probably until the end of the year because everything is pretty optimistic right now. So it's probably a trend. But that doesn't mean that you know, first I don't lose whatever I gained. IRAs, 401ks, they're... they're they come, they go. They go up and they down. Get, they go down. But I would not be without one. If you don't have a retirement account, you, you need a retirement account just as much as you need an emergency savings account. The long and the short is this. There are many considerations when it comes to your money. All are personal to you. Um, the risk level you can handle, the reward you expect, your ability to weather possible financial losses, um, so vehicles that you you use. Want. Do you want mutual funds like index funds, life cycle funds, balanced funds? Do you want to use a retirement account, a 401k, a 403b, an IRA, um, savings accounts, money markets, CDs? Do you want to use stocks? Um, do you want real estate? What what vehicle are you going to use? What makes you feel the most confident? But this is what Warren Buffett says. Warren Buffett says, rule number one, don't ever lose money. And rule number two, don't ever forget rule number one. So if you, you can do due diligence, ask yourself the most you can for whatever vehicle you want to use. Let's say you just want a savings account. Well, good. Get out there. Go to bankrate.com. Look at all of the, the accounts that are out there. One is going to earn you the most interest. And you don't have to have loyalty. If you have a savings account for five years with a bank and suddenly your bank comes up with a, a savings account that is up higher, you can move. There is no loyalty when it comes to money. The goal here is to make as much money as you can and have it as secure as you can. So here's a word of caution, and I know this caution very well because I have so much money. Uh, the stock market is rarely a place where anyone gets rich quick. It's sexy. It's, it's very exciting to be involved in the stock market. But if anyone could become a billionaire by investing, Warren Buffett would not be famous. It takes time, study, and effort, and most importantly, independent thought. Don't allow someone else to tell you what to do with your money. The stock market isn't fun. The investment is dominated by in banks and their bankers. 
They do all the big deals. They float companies, issue bonds, trade stocks, bonds, currencies, commodities, and they make a lot of money. They employ some of the world's brightest young MBAs whom they teach how to make money in the stock market, and they then they help them figure out how out new and improved profit-making ventures. They do all of this because it is a business with real money and real profits. Nobody's playing around. So unless you have money to play with, unless you won one of those half a billion dollar lotteries, the stock market is not for someone who can't afford to lose money. And things should be more like watching paint dry or watching grass grow. If you want excitement, to $800 and go to Las Vegas. So says Paul Samuelson, who was an economist back at the beginning of the century. And I've been warned, if you go online or if you pay any paperwork at the bank about their investment, for their insurance products, they're warning. It might be a, a, a little warning, but it is a warning. I found this warning at Wells Fargo and Bank of America. It's on their disclosures. It says investment and insurance products, not FDIC insured, no guarantee, max value. Okay. That's it right there. This is rookie business. Now, James' disclosure was a little, little bit more to read. Uh, investors should carefully consider the investment objectives, risks, charges, and expenses of any investment company before investing. The prospectus contains this and other information about an investment company. The prospectus is available from your financial advisor and should be read carefully before investing. Okay. Knowing that that's the warning, prospectus, this is why you need you need someone you can trust to help you through. If, you, if this is the way you're going, if you're going to choose annuities or if you're going to choose stocks, you need someone to help you through it. A group of get-rich-quickers who do make lots of money fast do it purely as a result of chance. They rarely keep their trading gains for very long. Even my brother was making $80,000. He lost it all. And now at I believe he's 59 years old now. He's doing construction, so it, it worked for a minute. But the mistake my brother made with all the money that he did make in the stock market, he didn't save any of it. He he spent it. So plan. What's the plan? What do you what do you want? Why do you want to save and invest? What's the whole goal that you've got going on? Are you establishing an emergency fund? That's got to be liquid. So you could put a, an emergency fund in a CD, but if you get it right away today, you may not be able to get it. So an emergency fund must be liquid. It should be a savings account. It should be something you can get to. Are you planning to buy a home? Great. It's an investment product for that, but it's got to be liquid within the time frame that you set. So perfect. If two years from now you want to have a home, you get a two-year CD. Save your money that way. Um, are you planning a retirement account? That's not liquid. Not until your age. Then it's then it's liquid. You have to wait until you're 59 and a half. So it's to me, it's one of the best investments you can make because you absolutely cannot touch it. Are you planning to start your own business? Great. Give it an IDA. Take that two years. Save up your money. Get your match. So that's not, well, liquid. I mean, if you need to drop out of the IDA program, the money that you've saved, you can have. You just don't get the match. Um, or you want financial security. If you want financial security, then you want liquid and non-liquid. You want a little bit of everything. Invest in a long-term endeavor. Um, not going to get rich overnight. Um, remember the story of the tortoise and the hare. When it comes to finances, be the tortoise. Slow steady. So know thyself and know thy excuses because we've got them. Time passes. So whether you save $5 this month or not, time passes. $5 a month for 10 years is $600. Ten from now, would you turn down an offer of six hundred? And that's exactly how simple it could be 
So, so what's keeping you from taking that first step? Is it, I'm not good with money, I don't have time to deal with my money? Um, a lot of the folks that I see, I see this excuse all the time. Once you pulled your credit reports, it's bad. I don't want to look at it. And okay, we've we've all got barriers. Um, not a numbers person. I hate paper, paperwork. Um, Orgation isn't my strong suit. I don't have enough money to save. I see that one all the time. I don't need a budget. I don't have enough money to budget. Uh, I'm too old, too young, or all the above. We have excuses, but you need to use your excuses. It, now is the time. Take the first step. That's a lot of places you can go for information. If you're like me and, and you like the Internet and you want to know things, uh, bankrate.com one of my favorite places to go because I understand everything that they say. I can type in a question and it will bring up information. If you are really thinking that you'd like to invest, that beginnersinvest.about.com is a good one. I don't always agree with every bit of information that they have on beginnersinvest.about.com, but it's a good good place to start. A.cnn.com. From there, you can go to Money Magazine and Fortune Magazine. Both have great articles. It'll help you maybe whet your appetite a little bit to to figure out where you want to go. But number one, the very best, www.saveandinvest.org, saveandinvest.org. It is really read, easy to understand. Of information, they they have information for military. They have information for persons with disabilities. They have information for people with a lot of money. So saveandinvest.org is my favorite. And that's that's about all I've got. Thank you. I'm someone I've been chatting away on mute. Um, thank you, Marlene, so much uh, for your presentation. I learned an awful lot. Uh, I'm really excited to check out um, this website that I hadn't known of before, which is powerwallet.com. You know, just a reminder for everyone on the line, we provide a lot of web resources. And while we're not uh, endorsing these websites, we do have to share them with you so that you can tap into some different options for information. I, wanted to I, give saw, I'm I, I, saw a, I saw a question there. It said um, steps for a person to build a credit history. Um, and just in case this would work for anyone, and I, I talk to people about this all the time, packing, um, if your mother or your father or your sister or brother has really pristine, beautiful credit, a young person can piggyback to be an authorized user on their credit card, that does not mean you get a credit card. It just means that you're an authorized user. So your good credit goes right onto your credit report. So it, it builds you because of their good credit. You can't hurt them. And the way they can hurt you is if their credit is bad and then you just ask to be taken off. So piggybacking is a great way for a young person to establish credit. Great. Thank you, Marlene. So you guys a little bit of information about savings and public benefits. And um, also, if you have some additional questions for Marlene, now is a great time to start putting them in the chat window. And we're going to do um, some Q&A before, before we leave each other today. But we, I know that some of you on the line, perhaps not all of you, receive um, some public benefit, perhaps in relation to your disability or through some other op- option. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the impact of savings on public benefits. Our survey that we did, the majority of folks who responded to the survey received SSDI, Social Security Disability Insurance. SSDI is one of uh, Social Security's two disability benefit programs, and it is generally for individuals who meet Social Security's definition of disability have required work credits, meaning that they paid into the system and so now they can take back out, 
or eligible as a disabled adult child. Whatever way somebody comes onto the SSDI rules, it's important that you understand that SSDI has no asset limit. So any of the savings opportunities that were described would not impact SSDI because there is no asset limit to be impacted. On this benefit program, you can have uh, 1K, IRA, savings, multiple homes. Um, you have incredible wealth, and as long as you meet Social Security's definition of disability and you have the required work credits, or you meet the definition and you're eligible as a disabled adult child, you, you're eligible for your SSDI. SSDI is concerned about earned income, and if you have questions about how earnings impact a person's SSDI benefit, I welcome you to go back and look at um, the webinar we did on that topic or feel free to email me with your questions. SI, however, Supplemental Security Income, works quite differently. In SSI, an individual is on those roles because they meet Social Security's definition of disability and they've proven that they have very limited income and assets. In 2012, that income would be under $698 a month and assets would be under $2,000. So in, in the SI world, have 401k, having an IRA, having high savings, that can impact a person's eligibility for SSI. We provide some of the things that SSI counts towards the asset limit, and you can see it's expect cash, bank accounts, stocks. Um, we have a list that goes on. Um, all assessment and retirement accounts would fall um, under counting because they uh, categorized as anything else you own which could be changed to cash. Even though there's a penalty, it still counts. I want to make sure you know that the home that a person lives in and the land it's on and one car of any value, as long as it's used for work uh, because of the weather and terrain of the area or for medical employments. So the home and one car do not count against the asset limit for SSI. There are also some assets that SSI does not count, and um, it, it's important to think about that. Of course, the home and the vehicle that, that we talked about, proper, uh, proper established trusts, a trust is a way for an individual to save money, and there's one that I'm particularly fond of called pooled trusts, which works much like a 401k and allows an individual to put in uh, their own money to decide um, to pay for anything that their public benefit doesn't provide. So those can be a um, great opportunity. Uh, all individual development accounts, as Marlene described, in development accounts are not counted against any public benefit rule as long as they're federally funded. So recall Marlene mentioned um, some IDAs are funded through temporary aid to needy family block grant dollars or AFI, which is Assets for Independence Act dollars. And when the IDA is funded through one of those two federal sources, then the money that the person saves, um, the money that's matched, and the interest on that money does not count against any federally funded public benefit. Individual development accounts can be very helpful um, if you're trying to hold on to SSI. We have a question in the chat box related to this. An individual asked, will having a 401k or IRA affect benefits like Medicaid, SSI, or SSDI? And um, you can now understand that for SSI, a 401k and an IRA would impact eligibility. For SDI, they would not impact eligibility because there's no asset limit. And for Medicaid, it becomes a may impact. Medicaid has a lot of different programs, and the rules are typically state rules. So you could be in a state that has uh, something like a Medicaid buy-in program, and in some states, like the state of New York, um, if an individual who meets Social Security's definition of disability and you are working at any level, then um, your 401k does not count against the Medicaid buy-in asset rules, and the asset um, amount that you can have is very high. I'm shy to quote it on the call because I don't know it right off the top of my head, um, but it is at least over $40,000. So it really depends on the state.
state that the person lives in. So it's important as you think about these different savings opportunities that you are thoughtful about whether or not you receive a public benefit, but take that next step to get additional information. You don't want to make assumptions that you're not allowed to have or participate um, when it could be that the, the rules are different based on where you live or the type of benefit that you get. I want to say one more thing along those lines. I hear from a lot of people who get information secondhand um, from others, and um, you know, sometimes that information can be accurate. Sometimes it's not, and so it's always good to do your own research as you're able to. We have some suggested next steps for you um, so that you can apply what you learn today, and also so that you can think about some of the other webinars that you've had a chance to participate in. All this information can really work together very beautifully. You've learned about financial literacy and budgeting. You've about understanding how public benefits are impacted by work, um, how to utilize long-term disability insurance to stay on the job for as long as possible, how to claim the earned income tax credit, and now how to think about investing. And when you use that together, it can provide a really powerful set of tools for you to work on your financial wellness. So I'd like to encourage you to think about the things that you've learned and to even visit the archives and to create a vision for your financial future, to write those goals down, to put them where you can see them um, so that there's something that you think about. As Marley mentioned, a lot of people are really uh, have shame around where their finances are, and it makes it easy to shy away from addressing them, but that's going to be helpful at all. So once you write your goals down, we want to encourage you to determine one way that you can take a step towards those goals. Maybe you examine your employment decisions and get more information on whether or not you can and should and are able to work given your health and the impact on your benefits. Um, explore investment opportunities. Uh, do some of the things Marlene suggested and identify some funds that you maybe hadn't thought about for savings and take action. It's um, easy to think about what we want to do, but it's hard to take that first step and take action. And so we want to encourage you to do that. We um, encourage you to set a goal to complete these uh, steps for the next few months and then share, share your experience with us. We're going to get in touch with you um, a, few months after, uh, a few months into the new year to hear back from you on what you did with the information you learned, um, what was information you that was useful to you, and what other kinds of information you'd like for our um, 2013 Financial Wellness Webinar Series. I also provide you the resources one more time so that as you view the archives, you'll have them twice, and contact information. If you uh, have any questions after this webinar or moving forward along your path towards financial wellness, I encourage you to send me an email so that I can help address any questions that you have or give me a call. And the questions I can answer, I'll pass on to our experts that we have on the different webinars with us. So to address some of the other questions that have come in through the um, chat box and see if we could unmute Marlene in case there's something that she can add to. The first question we had was um, during the portion on the earned income tax credit, an individual asked if SSI and SSDI recipients are not eligible. And I wanted to clarify that um, individuals who receive SSI and SSDI may be eligible to receive the earned income tax credit. That income doesn't qualify them. Um, they have to have, in addition, well, they don't have to have SSI or SSDI. SDI income at all, but if they do have it, they also have to have earned income. It's the earned income tax credit. So anybody to qualify has to have some level of earned income. There was a question about whether or not there is a maximum income limit to be eligible to participate in an IDA, which is an individual development account. Their income limit for IDA programs, an individual must uh, be eligible for TANF or be a TANF recipient or have adjusted gross household net I'm sorry adjusted gross household income equal to or less than 200% of the federal poverty level and have a household net worth less than $10,000 or and I always think this is the simplest one be eligible for the earned income tax credit and have a household net worth less than $10,000 
I had a question related to the earned income, um, sorry, related to individual development accounts. Um, an individual asked, where do the matching funds come from? And they come from several places. Um, as uh, ID programs apply um, for the federal grant dollars, they're required to um, show that they will have match money. And community-based programs typically look to banks. Sometimes they look to uh, other nonprofits in their area, like United Way. Uh, we at National Disability Institute have helped provide a small amount of match money um, to an IDA program that we were working in partnership with. Match money is really going to come from anywhere. For the individual, the money comes from the IDA program. So I'm participating in an IDA program. When I save $2,000, the IDA program will match my money. I also had a question asking, is the IDA similar to an SSI pass? The SSI pass is a plan for achieving self-support. It allows a person who receives SSI to set some of, of their, uh, to set some aside any money except for their SSI toward an employment goal. So the PASS plan is very specific. The individual has to be working towards an employment goal. And they don't necessarily have to be working. Um, they can have any money other than their SSI to um, set aside. And I say um, the first difference is that the individual has to be working. They have to have earnings to put into the IDA. And the second is that um, the individual is going to be saving towards, uh, right now the three federally approved assets are post-secondary education, business capital, or a home. And for individuals who rely on SSI, an IDA can be very powerful because it can be the only path to home ownership as it allows a person to set aside their savings towards home ownership into that protected IDA savings account. I have some new questions, and so I'll um, address them. One is asking, does private disability insurance count as earned income? And I'm not sure if that's in relation to um, the individual development account. And I have to say for myself, I don't know the answer to that question. Marlene, do you? I'm actually reading about that today, and I don't think it counts as earned income. But you, the person who provided that question, if you want to send it in, um, I'd be happy to further research it with um, the Assets for Independence Act folks and get their take on that. Another individual asked, is it mandatory to use the IDA program to save for the purchase of a home or for education? Um, Marlene, would you like to answer that one? No, you don't have to use an IDA program to purchase a home or for education. An IDA program is just a vehicle. That's all. It is a vehicle um, to help you um, with discipline to save and to learn about financial stability. So um, there are many other ways that you can pay for the purchase of a home or for education, not just an IDA. The thing to oh, about no, I'm looking at it the other way, but yes, the program not be used for things other than the ends of a home or education or business. But I've said that. <laughs> That's right. Uh, the thing to remember about IDAs is that if you're somebody on the line who um, yourself or somebody you, you support um, is needs to hold on to a public benefit like SSI or a Medicaid benefit that has an, an uh, asset limit, then the IA can be a great resource because it will, as long as it's federally funded, it will give a person a protected savings vehicle to save money towards their asset goal while not losing eligibility for their public benefit. Uh, I now understand that the question about whether or not disability insurance would count as earned income was actually in reference to the earned income tax credit. And, um, I, I did not know the answer, but there is an answer on irs.gov that the payments you received from a disability insurance policy that you paid the premiums for are not earned income. If you want the link to that, um, please feel free to shoot me an email, and I'd be happy to provide that for you. So it seems to be all of the questions we have in the chat box. 
Um, I want to give another thank you to our guest presenter, Marlene Ware. Uh, Marlene, I really uh, genuinely enjoyed your presentation and learned a lot, so thank you so much. You're welcome, and cross your fingers because I'm working on starting an IDA. So cross your fingers that I will be able to make it come to fruition. Excellent. Good job. Congratulations. Thank you. It's a lot of work. I hope uh, everyone else on the line that you have a wonderful holiday season and that you take the opportunity to view some of our other archives. This was our last webinar for the 2012 Financial Wellness Webinar Series sponsored by Accorda Therapeutics. If you haven't had a chance to watch all of the webinars, please visit our archives. And as you watch, if you have any questions at all, please feel free to reach out to me, Elizabeth Jennings, at ejenningsndi-inc.org. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful day.